You farmers of Kent who are jolly and gay, come listen a while and pray mind what I say. The Wield at War, a portrait of the life of Siegfried Sassoon from his boyhood in the Kentish Weald to the trenches of the Great War. Oh, good hopping, oh, good hopping, oh, good hopping, good hopping, oh. Siegfried Sassoon was born in 1886 in Matfield in the Kentish Weald. His mother admired Wagner, hence Siegfried. His paternal grandparents were Sephardic Jews. Sassou means joy in Hebrew. The Sassoon side of the family had made their money in cotton in India and after their move to England had achieved significant commercial success, notoriety and royal favour through their friendship with the Prince of Wales. His maternal grandparents were very different. The Thornycross were descendants of English yeomanry. Both were sculptors and benefited from the patronage of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. Their youngest daughter, Teresa, married Alfred Sassoon in 1884. Alfred was a dilettante who quickly tired of country life. After three sons arrived in quick succession, Michael, Siegfried and Hamo, he began an affair with an American authoress and after five years of marriage left Teresa. Sassoon's family lived in Weirley, just outside Matfield, where they'd moved in 1884. The house is still there, rather ugly, but with a splendid view over the Weald. Looked at from our lawn, the Weald was, in my opinion, as good a view as anyone could wish to live with. You could run your eyes along more than 20 miles of a low-hilled horizon, never more than 10 or 12 miles away. The foreground was an easy-going prospect of meadows, orchards and hop gardens, supervised by the companionable cows of hop kilns. The medway was there, winding lazily. Leisurely trains went along the valley, up to London or down to the coast, whistling derisively when they bustled through our station without stopping. Tomorrow I should be rambling heedlessly in the woods or angling by the orchard pond, where a dallying bee buzzes happy humdrum summer for me. Oh, may they prove fine to and fetch a great price That you, my brave boys, might get rich in a thrice For as ye are ever both hearty and free Success to you all for to fill you with glee Sassoon's boyhood had five strong elements Cricket, horses, golf, music and poetry He played cricket for Matfield, Brenchley and the Blue Mantles at the Neville Ground in Tunbridge Wells, rode with the Erich Hunt, and from playing the nine-hole course at Lamberhurst, he moved on to play the best local courses. At the age of nine, he was given his first pony. I was full of tremulous emulation when Dixon appeared proudly, parading a very small black pony with a flowing mane and tail. I soon found myself on its back, my mother's agitated objections were rapidly overruled and my equestrianism became an established fact. Grasping the pommel of the saddle with both hands, I was carried down the drive as far as the gate. The pony's movements were cautious and demure. On the return journey, Dixon asked me whether I didn't think him a little beauty, but I was speechless with excitement and could only nod my assent. When I relinquished my apprehensive hold on the saddle and for the first time in my life gathered up the reins, Dixon greeted this gesture with a glance of approval, at the same time placing a supporting hand on my shoulder. Stick your knees in, sir, he said, adding, I can see you'll make a rider all right. He had never called me sir before, and my heart warmed towards him as I straightened my back and resolved to do him credit. At 14, he went to Marlborough College. Whilst there, he developed his poetic vocation and achieved his first published poem. It was a parody inspired by a debate in cricket circles about raising the height of the wicket. 
entitled The Extra Inch, it was published in Cricket in 1903. Oh, batsman, rise and go and stop the rot, and go and stop the rot. It was indeed a rot, six down for 23. The batsman thought how wretched was his lot, and all alone went he. The bowler bared his mighty cunning arm, his vengeance reeking arm, his large yet wily arm, with fearful powers endowed. The batsman took his guard, a deadly calm had fallen on the crowd. Oh, is it half volley or a long hop? A seventh bounce, long hop, a fast and fierce long hop that the bowler letteth fly? The ball was straight and bowled him neck and crop. He knew not how or why. Full, sad and slow, pavilion wards he walked. The careless critics talked. Some said that he was yorked, a half volley at a pinch. The batsman murmured as he inward stalked. It was the extra inch. So soon's life after leaving Marlborough seemed to epitomise the sunlit image of Edwardian England. He was comfortably off, happy in his sporting pursuits, and committed to his poetic work. He collated his poems and published them in a private edition. For some years, that was his chosen method of publication. He captured the mood of the time when he wrote of the Brenchley Flower Show cricket match. From an undersized platform, the Brenchley brass brand now struck up the soldiers of the Queen. It was quite like playing in a county match, I thought, as I scanned the spectators who were sitting on two sides of the field. The local gentry were sauntering towards the tea tent after a gossiping inspection of the flower show. It was quite a brilliant scene, which the Brenchley band was doing its utmost to sustain with experimental and unconvincing tootles and drum beatings. Soon, however, the band was overwhelmed by the steam organ, which, after a warning hoot, began to accompany the revolving wooden horses of the gilded roundabout with a strident and blaring fanfaronade. For a minute or two, the contest of cacophonies continued, but in spite of a tempestuous effort, the band was completely outplayed by its automatic and inexhaustible adversary. The discord became intolerable. It seemed possible that the batsmen would appeal against the music, in the same way that they sometimes appeal against the light. William Hodges, the saddler and church warden, was equal to the emergency. With an ample gesture, he conveyed himself across the ground and prohibited the activity of the steam organ until the match was finished. The flitting steeds now revolved and undulated noiselessly, beneath their gilded canopy, while the Brenchley band palavered peacefully onward into the unclouded jollity of the afternoon. He went up to Cambridge in 1905. Starting initially in law, he switched to history, but academic work failed to engage him, and he came down in 1907 without taking a degree. The next seven years were spent in poetry and sport, and building up his private library of books. Sassoon was a social person, and one of his pleasures was dancing at balls held in the country houses in the area. I was an enthusiastic dancer, an earnest rather than volatile performer. With my patent leather pumps I never sat out anything, not even the lancers, and I was hard at it until the band had played its final bar. I still overhear the muffled thrum and throb of music from ballrooms thirty years ago, Overhearing, perhaps, that blue Hungarian band, which we all thought so wonderful. Sassoon had continued to ride and journeyed to different hunts around the country. Having acquired a likely new horse, Cockbird, he decided he was ready for steeplechasing and entered for the South Down Hunt heavyweight race. His main competitor was Gunner Major Brownrig on Mikado. We were now more than three quarters of the way round, and there was a sharp turn left-handed where we entered the last half mile of the course. Brownrig looked round, and then went steadily on across a level and rather wet field, which compelled me to take a last pull at Cockbird and let my horse go after him. When I'd drawn up to him, 
It was obvious that Cockbird and Mikado were the only horses left in it. I was alone with a formidable brown rig. The difference between us was that he was quite self-contained and I was palpitating with excitement. We were side by side. Approaching the fourth fence from the finish, he hit his horse and went ahead. This caused Cockbird to quicken his pace and make his first mistake, which so nearly caused me to come unstuck. Nearly, but not quite. For after my arrival at Cockbird's ears, his recovery tipped me halfway back again and he cantered across the next field with me clinging round his neck. At one moment I was almost in front of his chest. I said to myself, I will not fall off, as I gradually worked my way back into the saddle before we arrived at the next fence. After that really remarkable recovery of mine, life became lyrical, beatified, ecstatic, or anything else you like to call it. To put it tersely, I just galloped past Brownrig, nailed the last two fences, and won by ten lengths. Needless to say that Dixon's was the first person I was aware of. His eager look and the way he said, Well done, were beyond all doubt the quintessence of what my victory meant to me. As for Cockbird, he had become the equine equivalent of divinity. In 1914, as the likelihood of war increased, he decided to volunteer and took a medical. Immediately war was declared, he joined up, the first of the war poets to do so. There's a certain fellow everybody knows To the very core he's British We've all seen him toiling week by week Doing this and doing that for his daily keep Suddenly he's heard that he was wanted To back up Tommy Atkins in the fray Then like a true born Brit He donned a soldier's kit And so we doff our hats to him and say Bravo, bravo, British volunteer Gallant volunteer Give them all a cheer How they nobly answer duty's call Ready to fight for Britain and for all God bless them! Patriotic to the backbone Leaving home and friends most dear He'll be quite a big surprise -er To the German Kaiser Bravo British volunteer! Initially he was a trooper in the Sussex Yeomanry I'd already been offered a commission, but how could I have accepted it when everybody was saying that the Germans might land at Dover any day? I was safe in the army and that was all I cared about. In October he broke his arm in a riding fall and during his recovery he decided to try for a commission in the hope that he would get to the front quicker in the infantry than in the cavalry. He joined the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and in April of 1915 went to the training depot at Litherland near Liverpool and close to the Formby golf course. Litherland was an unattractive neighbourhood. The district was industrial. Half a mile away were the chimneys of Bryant's match factory. Considerably closer was a hissing and throbbing inferno which incessantly concocted the form of high explosive known as TNT. When the wind was in the east the camp got the benefit of the fumes, which caused everyone to cough. Adjoining the camp was a large cemetery. Frequent funeral processions cheered up the troops. The surrounding country, with its stunted dwelling houses and dingy trees, disconsolate canal and flat root fields, was correspondingly unlikable. I was in a soldier manufactory although I did not see it in that way at the time. While at Litherland, David Thomas arrives. His was the bright countenance of truth, ignorant and undoubting, incapable of concealment, but strong in reticence and modesty. He was, in fact, as good as gold, and everyone knew it as soon as they knew him. David and Sassoon would be close companions as they moved to France. He finally embarked for France in November 1915, over a year since he'd volunteered. 
At that time he heard of the death of his brother, Hamo, who died aged 28 in Gallipoli and was buried at sea. Give me your hand, my brother. Search my face. Look in these eyes, lest I should think of shame. For we have made an end of all things base. We are returning by the road we came. Your lot is with the ghost of soldiers dead, and I am in the field where men must fight. But in the gloom I see your laurelled head, and through your victory I shall win the light. On arriving in France, he met Robert Graves for the first time. Graves was about to publish his first collection of poems, Over the Brazier, and with Sassoon would become one of the most celebrated war poets. He showed Graves his latest poem, Absolution. The anguish of the earth absolves our eyes till beauty shines in all that we can see. War is our scourge, yet war has made us wise, and fighting for our freedom we are free. Horror of wounds and anger at the foe and loss of things desired, all these must pass. We are the happy legion, for we know time's but a golden wind that shakes the grass. There was an hour when we were loath to part from life we longed to share no less than others. Now, having claimed this heritage of heart, what need we more, my comrades and my brothers? Graves was not impressed by Sassoon's romantic view of war. He moved to the front-line trenches in March 1916. On the second day's march, we passed an infantry brigade of Kitchener's army. It was raining. The flat, dreary landscape was half hidden by mist, and the road was liquid mud. Four after four they came, some of them wearing the steel basin helmets, which were new to the English armies then. The helmets gave them a Chinese look. Their faces looked sullen, wretched and brutal as they sweated with their packs under glistening waterproof capes. Worried civilian officers on horses, younger-looking subalterns in new rainproof trench coats, and behind the grudging column, the heavy transport horses plodding through the sludge, straining at their loads, and the stolid drivers munching, smoking, grinning, yelling coarse jibes at one another. It was the war all right, and they were going in the direction of it. Come to the cookhouse door, boys, sniff at the lovely stew. Who is it said the colonel gets better grub than you? Any complaints this morning? Do we complain? Not we! What's the matter with lumps of onion floating around your tea? Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, it's a lovely war. Who wouldn't be a soldier, eh? Oh, it's a shame to take the pay. As soon as Ravalli is gone, we feel just as heavy as lead. But we never get up till the sergeant brings our breakfast up to bed. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. What do we want with eggs and ham when we've got plum and apple jam? Form, force, right, turn, how do we spend the money we earn? Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Initially, Sassoon was not in the trenches, having been made transport officer, and his mood was still optimistic. It took only a few more weeks of the reality of trench warfare for his view to change. Sassoon's poetry before the war had been seen as imitative of the Romantics and Pre-Raphaelites, containing, as one critic pertinently wrote, far too much of the worn-out stuff and garb of poetry. War was to give a new edge to his writing and see his transformation into one of the finest satirists of the First World War. In the Pink So Davis wrote, This leaves me in the pink. Then scrawled his name, your loving sweetheart Willie, with crosses for a hug. He'd had a drink of rum and tea, and though the barn was chilly, for once his blood ran warm. He had pay to spend. Winter was passing. Soon the year would mend. But he couldn't sleep that night. Stiff in the dark, he groaned, and thought of Sundays at the farm, 
and how he'd go as cheerful as a lark in his best suit to wander arm in arm with brown-eyed Gwen and whisper in her ear the simple, silly things she liked to hear. And then he thought, tomorrow night we trudge up to the trenches and my boots are rotten, five miles of stodgy clay and freezing sludge and everything but wretchedness forgotten. Tonight he's in the pink, but soon he'll die. And still the war goes on. He don't know why. In March 1916, David Thomas, his great love since their training camp days, was killed, shot through the throat. So Tommy left us, a gentle soldier, perfect and without stain, and he will always remain in my heart, fresh and happy and brave. Think no more, lad, laugh, be jolly. Why should men make haste to die? Empty heads and tongues are talking. Make the rough road easy walking. And the feather pays of folly bears the falling sky. Is jesting, dancing, drinking, spins the heavy world around. If young hearts were not so clever, oh, they would be young forever. Think no more, tis lonely thinking, lays lads No more, lad, laugh, be jolly. Why should men make haste to die? Empty heads and tongues are talking. Make the rough road easy walking. And the feather pays of folly bears the falling sky. The impact of this loss. The death of his brother and the constant pressure of war changed so soon. I'd more or less made up my mind to die. The idea made things easier. In the circumstances, there didn't seem to be anything else to be done. He went into the front-line trenches a week later. Discounting personal safety, he would go under the wire at night into no man's land, searching for prey. His aim with the grenade was accurate, thanks to his cricket skills. His behaviour earned him the title Mad Jack. After a training break, he returned to the front, and when a raiding party failed, he went out to rescue one of his men, O'Brien. The bombing and rifle fire had slackened when I started out to look for him. Bullets hit the water and little showers of earth pattered down the banks. Pawing the loose earth and dragging my legs after me, I worked my way round the crater. O'Brien wasn't there. So I got across into the other one, which was even more precipitous and squashy. Down there I discovered him. Another man was crouching beside him, wounded in one arm and patiently waiting for help. O'Brien moaned when I touched him. He seemed to have been hit in several places. His companion whispered huskily, Get a rope! With a rope, with a man to help, I got back to O'Brien and we lifted him up the side of the crater. It was heavy work for he was tall and powerfully built, and the soft earth gave way under our feet as we lugged and hoisted the limp, shattered body. The Germans must have seen us in the half-light, but they'd stopped firing. Perhaps they felt sorry for us. At last we lowered him over the parapet. A stretcher-bearer bent over him, and then straightened himself, taking off his helmet with a gesture that vaguely surprised me by its reverent simplicity. O'Brien had been one of the best men in our company. I looked down at him and then turned away. His face was grotesquely terrible, smeared with last night's burnt cork, the forehead matted with a tangle of dark hair. I had now accounted for everyone. Two killed and ten wounded was the only result of the raid. One of the wounded was a grey-haired lance corporal who had one of his feet almost blown off. When he was sitting on the fire step, he said, Thank God Almighty for this. I've been waiting 18 months for it, 
and now I can go home. The One-Legged Man Propped on a stick, he viewed the August weald, squat orchard trees and oasts with painted cows, a homely, tangled hedge, a cornstalk field, and sound of barking dogs and farmyard fowls. And he'd come home again to find it more desirable than ever it was before. How right it seemed that he should reach the span of comfortable years allowed to man, splendid to eat and sleep and choose a wife, safe with his wound, a citizen of life. He hobbled blithely through the garden gate and thought, thank God they had to amputate. Sassoon was awarded the military cross for conspicuous gallantry during a raid on the enemy's trenches. He remained in action for one and a half hours under rifle and bomb fire, collecting and bringing in the wounded. Owing to his courage and dedication, all the killed and wounded were brought in. They were summoned from the hillside, they were called in from the glen. And the country found them ready at the stirring call for men. Let no tears add to their hardship as the soldiers pass along. And although your heart is breaking, make it sing this cheery song. On July the 1st, 1916, the Battle of the Somme began at Carnoy. Down in the hollow there's the whole brigade, camped in four groups. Through twilight falling slow, I hear a sound of mouth organs, ill played, and murmur of voices, gruff, confused and low. Crouched among thistle tufts, I've watched the glow of a blurred orange sunset flare and fade, and I'm content. Tomorrow we must go to take some cursed wood. Oh, world God made. In mid-July he met up again with Graves. In the German counter-offensive, Graves was seriously wounded, but it was reported to Sassoon that Graves had been killed. The battle continued. In one attack, the man next to him, Lance Corporal Kendall, was shot through the head by a sniper. Sassoon decided to settle that sniper. If I'd stopped to think, I shouldn't have gone at all. As it was, I discarded my tin hat and equipment, slung a bag of bombs across my shoulder, and set off at a downhill double. While I was running, I pulled the safety pin out of my Mills bomb. My right hand being loaded, I did the same for my left. I was halfway across, and not so reckless as I'd been when I started. I was even a little out of breath as I trotted up the opposite slope. Just before I arrived at the top, I slowed up and threw my two bombs. Then I rushed at the bank, vaguely expecting some sort of scuffle with my imagined enemy. I had lost my temper with the man who'd shot Kendall. Quite unexpectedly, I found myself looking down into a well-conducted trench with a great many Germans in it. Fortunately for me, they were already retreating. It did not occur to them that they were being attacked by a single fool, 
and Firmby, with presence of mind which probably saved me, had covered my advance by traversing the top of the trench with his Lewis gun. I slung a few more bombs, but they fell short of the clumsy field-grey figures, some of whom had turned to fire their rifles over their left shoulder as they ran across the open towards the wood, while a crowd of jostling helmets vanished along the trench. Idiotically elated, I stood there with my finger in my right ear and emitted a series of BIOHOLOS! In late July he was taken ill and was carried to the Red Cross Hospital. A genial doctor came along and had a look at me. He had a newspaper in his hand as he glanced at the descriptive chart behind my bed. My name caused him to consult the Times. Is this you? he asked. Sure enough. My name was there, in a list of military crosses which chanced to have appeared that day. The doctor patted me on the shoulder and informed me that I should be going across to England next day. Good luck had wangled me home. After the head of the Somme, he recuperated at Somerville College, Oxford, now a hospital, and discovered that Graves was, after all, alive. During his convalescence, his views on the war hardened. In France, in the four months since July, 419,654 men had been killed or wounded. He was taken up by Lady Ottoline Morel, whose home, Garsington Hall, was a refuge for conscientious objectors. There he would meet leading pacifists such as Burton Russell and Lytton Strachey, and the Melia strengthened his resentment of the patriotic suppression of the reality of the Western Front. Hearing claims that German peace overtures had been turned down, he felt a growing need to protest. His poetry, increasingly satirical, expressed his mood. They. The bishop tells us, When the boys come back, they will not be the same, for they'll have fought in a just cause. They lead the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades' blood has brought new right to breed an honourable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. We are none of us the same, the boys reply, for George lost both his legs and Bill's stone blind. Poor Jim's shot through the lungs and luck to die, and Bert's gone syphilitic. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some change. And the bishop said, The ways of God are strange. We are Fred Connor's army, the ragtime infantry. We cannot fight, we cannot march, what earthly use are we? And when we get to Berlin, the Kaiser, he will say, Hock, hock, mein Gott, what a jolly rotten lot are the ragtime infantry. He and Graves were reunited. Both had begun to see the war as merely a sacrifice of the idealistic younger generation to the stupidity and self-protective alarm of the elder. The General Good morning, good morning, the General said, when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead, and we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack, as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. But the two poets agreed that it was better to be at the front where there was no time to rationalise. Sassoon said they were poets first and foremost and should prove by their own courage that poets were not idle dreamers. They were both passed fit for duty and assembled at the Litherland Depot in December 1916. Sassoon's return was delayed until February, when he travelled to the infantry base at Rouen. His reaction to several weeks 
in the company of complacent staff officers led him to write base details. If I were fierce and bald and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base and speed glum heroes up the line to death. You'd see me with my puffy, petulant face, guzzling and gulping in the best hotel, reading the Roll of Honour. Poor young chap, I'd say. I used to know his father well. Yes, we have lost heavily in this last scrap. And when the war is done and youth stone dead, I toddle safely home and die in bed. As he prepared for the spring offensive, he heard that Graves had been declared unfit for further service. At this point, the Germans retreated to the well-prepared Siegfried Line, soon moved up to the deserted Hindenburg Line in April. The Battle of Arras was to follow, and once again he showed his reckless approach to soldiery. There seemed to be a lull in the noise of the attack. I thought what a queer state of things it all was, and decided to take a peep at the surrounding country. This was a mistake which ought to have put an end to my terrestrial adventures, for no sooner had I popped my silly head out of the sap than I felt a tremendous blow in the back between my shoulders. A sniper had shot him through the right shoulder from the front, missing both his jugular vein and spine by a fraction of an inch. Some days later, he was in the 4th London Hospital in Denmark Hill, and from there to Chapelwood Manor in Sussex. Convalescing, he slept badly. At this point, he was contemplating publishing something outspoken. He met with Burton Russell and another pacifist, John Middleton Murray, and together with Murray, he drafted his statement. The Statement I am making this statement as an act of willful defiance of military authority because I believe that the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. I am a soldier, convinced that I am acting on behalf of soldiers. I believe that this war, upon which I entered as a war of defence and liberation, has now become a war of aggression and conquest. I believe that the purposes for which I and my fellow soldiers entered upon this war should have been so clearly stated as to have made it impossible to change them, and that, had this been done, the objects which actuated us would now be attainable by negotiation. I have seen and endured the sufferings of the troops, and I can no longer be a party to prolong these sufferings for ends which I believe to be evil and unjust. I am not protesting against the conduct of the war, but against the political errors and insincerities for which the fighting men are being sacrificed. He delayed sending out his statement. He was due back at Litherland on June the 27th, but had no intention of reporting then, since part of his protest was to refuse to serve in the army. He would wait until summoned. The telegraph came on July the 4th to report immediately. He responded by sending his statement to his commanding officer, who he felt should see it first together with a private letter expressing the greatest possible regret. He then circulated copies of his statement to a wide list of people, mainly sympathetic to his view. Graves was appalled, feeling that the Garsington pacifists were the cause and the Sassoon could be court-martialed, cashiered and imprisoned. He argued with the authorities the Sassoon was suffering from war weariness that the matter should be treated as medical rather than a rebellion. Unaware of this, Sassoon returned to Litherland. He refused to withdraw his statement, maintaining poise and conviction to avoid any suggestion of mental collapse. Despite this, he was commanded to attend a specially arranged medical board. He tore up the summons and threw the ribbon of his military cross in the Mersey. The situation had become very serious. Graves was told that Sassoon would never get his show trial, but instead, if he persisted, he would be declared insane and sent to an asylum. He told Sassoon, who was shaken and agreed to go before the medical board. 
which declared him to be suffering from neurasthenia and sent him to Craig Lockhart Hospital near Edinburgh. He journeyed north on July the 23rd, 1917, arriving at a gloomy, cavernous place, a live museum of neuroses. However, he welcomed walking the countryside and was delighted in the nearness of a golf course. He read, made notes for poems, and generally relaxed in what he called Dottyville. On July the 30th, an MP, Lee Smith, rose in the Commons and read out the statement. Next day, it was national news. Sassoon began to be treated by W. H. R. Rivers, a doctor and psychologist. Rivers recognised that Sassoon was emotionally and intellectually immature, or as Sassoon described himself, a shy and callow youth. This at 30 years of age. His mad Jack period could be seen as adolescent, bravado rather than bravery. His four months at Craig Lockhart were creatively positive, and by the end of his stay, he produced the bulk of his next volume of war poetry, Counterattack. Of his companions in the hospital, he wrote, Survivors. No doubt they'll soon get well. The shock and strain have caused their stammering, disconnected talk. Of course, they're longing to go out again. These boys with old, scared faces, learning to walk. They'll soon forget their haunted nights, their cowed subjection to the ghosts of friends who died, their dreams that drip with murder, and they'll be proud of glorious war that shattered all their pride. Men who went out to battle, grim and glad. Children with eyes that hate you, broken and mad. In such his time, which takes in trust our youth, our joys, and all we have, and pays us but with age and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shut up, shut up the story of our days. But from his earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust.
Sir Simon's attitude to his own situation began to change. The failure of his protest, the many casualties among his regiment at the Battle of Ypres, made him increasingly guilty at being safely out of the trenches. At Passchendaele, there'd been 70,000 dead and 170,000 injured. He persuaded Rivers to arrange a new medical board to clear him for active duty. He returned to Litherland in December 1917, and did find it almost empty since the Fusiliers had been sent to Ireland. So soon began 1918, the last year of the war, at the near deserted Litherland, filling his time with golf, hunting and socialising, until February when he was posted to Egypt. There life was routine, with the main task to repair roads. The monotony was relieved by a concert party. They're gathering round out of the twilight. Over the grey-blue sand, shoals of low, jargoning men drift inward to the sound, the jangle and throb of a piano, tum ti tum Drawn by a lamp they come, out of the glimmering lines of their tents, over the shuffling sand. Oh, sing us the songs, the songs of our own land, you warbling ladies in white. Dimness conceals the hunger in our faces, this wall of faces risen out of the night, these eyes that keep their memories of the places so long beyond their sight. Jaded and gay, the ladies sing, and the chap in brown tilts his grey hat. Jaunty and lean and pale, he rattles the keys, some actor bloke from town. God send you home, and then a long, long trail. I hear you calling me, and Dixieland sings slowly. Now the chorus, one by one, we hear them, drink them, till the concert's done. Silent, I watch the shadowy mass of soldiers stand. Silent, they drift away over the glimmering sand. There's a long, long trail a-winding Into the land of my dreams Where the nightingales are singing And the white moon beams There's a long, long night of waiting Until my dreams all come true Till the day when I'll be going down that long, long trail with you. After his uneventful time in Palestine, in April the company was shipped back to France, arriving in Marseille and then by train to northern France and to Arras. Given the command, he gained great satisfaction in training his men into a glorious company. As a return to action neared, he began to revert to his mad Jack persona. He was gazetted acting captain again. As his company moved up to the front, his anti-war poems collection, Counterattack, was published. Almost all the poems were fiercely critical of the war, but public opinion had moved with him, and his attitude was widely shared by the British Army of 1918. Back in action, Sassoon was in fighting mood, constantly venturing out at night into no man's land, despite orders to remain within the war. I was tired and overstrained, and my old foolhardiness was taking control of me. After a raid on a machine gun nest, he was still in no man's land when the sun came up. Visible to his own side, but not to the Germans, he took off his steel helmet and stood up to survey the German lines. He felt a terrific blow to his head. He had been grazed by a bullet fired by one of his own sentries. Friendly fire, as we now call it. Although only a flesh wound, it was the end of Sassoon's soldiering. He returned to England on July the 18th. In hospital, he battled fever, infection and sleepless nights. When eventually recovered, he found himself a society hero and in the company of the Sitwells, T. Lawrence, Noel Coward, and in talks with Winston Churchill and visits to Thomas Hardy. 
Finally, the war ended at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month. This is now the annual day of remembrance held at the Cenotaph built in 1920. It commemorates the 564,175 British Army deaths in France and Flanders between 1914 and 1918. Seeing it, Sassoon wrote, At the Cenotaph. I saw the Prince of Darkness with his staff standing bareheaded by the Cenotaph. Unostentatious and respectful, there he stood and offered up the following prayer. Make them forget, O Lord, what this memorial means. Their discredited ideas revive. Breed new belief that war is purgatorial, proof of the pride and power of being alive. Men's biologic urge to readjust the map of Europe, Lord God of hosts, increase. Lift up their hearts in large, destructive lust, and crown their heads with blind, vindictive peace. The Prince of Darkness to the Cenotaph bowed, and as he walked away, I heard him laugh. On March the 11th, 1919, the London Gazette announced Lieutenant Acting Captain S. L. Sassoon, M.C., relinquishes his acting rank, is placed on the retired list on account of ill health caused by wounds, 12th of March, 1919, and is granted the rank of Captain. After serving from the outbreak in 1914, Siegfried's war was over. He died in 1967 at the age of 80. Everyone suddenly burst out singing and I was filled with such delight as prison birds must find in freedom, winging wildly across the white orchards and dark green fields, on, on and out of sight. Everyone's voice was suddenly lifted, and beauty came like the setting sun. My heart was shaken with tears, and horror drifted away. Oh, but everyone was a bird, and the song was wordless. The singing will never be 